This is the Caracol, a lake on the roof of the world. The Caracol can be found high in the Pamir Mountains. Its name translates from Tajik to mean the black lake on the roof of the world. The higher the mountain you climb, the darker the lake appears. Some of the mountain summits surrounding the lake are taller than 7,000 meters. located in northeastern Tajikistan at nearly 4,000 meters above sea level. The lake is surrounded by the snow-capped peaks of the Panias mountain range. All roads to the Tajik Pamirs lead over Korog, which is the capital of the autonomous region of Badakhshan. Korog has only 30,000 inhabitants. There are no other large towns or cities within 500 kilometers of Korog. This means that the central shopping area, known as the Bazaar, is one of the largest and most important in the country. Tajikistan, officially the Republic of Tajikistan, is a mountainous, landlocked country in Central Asia. Most of Tajikistan's population belongs to the Persian-speaking Tajik ethnic group. Korog is a hub for many ethnic groups to convene. Tajiks from the hot subtropical west of the country haggle here in Korog with Pamiri from the Rivak area and Uzbeks from the Fergana Valley and Kirkis from the upland of the eastern Pamirs. to reach the mountains via the legendary Pamir Highway, you'll find that Korog is the last stop to get supplies for the upcoming day's travel through the mountains. The Pamir Highway is a road traversing the Pamir Mountains through Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan in Central Asia. It is the only continuous route through the difficult terrain of the mountains. The journey to Karakul is long and arduous. First, it crosses the breakneck paths along the Panchatales. Then you arrive at the Panj River, a tributary of the Amu Darya. The river is 1,125 kilometers long and forms a considerable part of the Afghanistan-Tajikistan border. Here, the Soviet army and Mujahideen fought long and bloody battles. Warning signs for minefields can be found along the border, as many regions are still littered with mines left behind from those battles. These areas are highly dangerous. Tajiks live on the Afghan side of the river too. Here, the men still wear the traditional dress of kurta and turban, which is not found in Tajikistan. The path, artistically carved into this side of the mountain, appears to be even more precarious and narrow than the road on the Tajik side. But even with traffic warning signs, 
There is no way of alerting all travelers to some of the hazards ahead that may greet them. Rather unusually, the locals choose to clean their carpets out on the road. The floors of their homes are made of packed clay, a porous substance that would absorb water too quickly to ensure the rugs are cleaned properly. There are few alternatives to the water-resistant asphalt of the highway, so these locals would appear to rather risk their lives cleaning on the road than have a dirty rug in their home. Water is the greatest and most precious resource of Tajikistan. In ancient times, the Panj River turned the Asian deserts into lush green gardens. Once the river ran under the name of the Oxus, during this era, it was considered one of the four rivers of paradise. But this paradise has come under threat in recent times. Environmental expert Yamshed is on his way to the mountains to investigate where the threat to the river lies. The Pamir and the Tian Shan are two mountain ranges that play a very important role in all of Central Asia. Most of our rivers are fed via glaciers. This means they originate from glaciers, flow through the valleys and provide water for the people of Central Asia. Clear, clean water. But now we have a problem. Many scientists claim that the glaciers are getting smaller. Some say that the glaciers have lost 35% of their mass in the last 20 to 25 years. And scientists fear in another 20 years, only a third of today's ice will remain. This would be a disaster. There would simply be no more water. The people here would have no drinking water and nothing to irrigate their fields. Potentially, it would be an ecological disaster. The mountains are the source of all water in Garm Chashma. Before the water settles, it embarks on a journey through the mountains. As the water travels, it becomes enriched with natural mineral salts, producing these bizarre salt domes and a solution famous for its medicinal properties. According to Tajik doctors, if a treatment at the Dead Sea provides the patient with six months relief of certain skin diseases, then the enriched waters here will offer remedies that will last as long as a year. The path from Korog to the Karakul along the Panj Valley and the mountains of the Pamir is about 500 kilometers long. However, even travelers in a hurry should anticipate that this journey will last much longer than a day. It is impossible to get to Karakul in eight hours, not only because of the long distance, but there are high altitude roads in poor condition. For the journey to Karakul, you need to allow several days. But there is plenty to see along the way. In the valley of the Panj River, a great deal of evidence can be found to prove that the area has been inhabited for thousands of years. This includes a Stone Age ritual site with its famous petroglyphs perched high in the mountains of Langar. Here you can find rock drawings depicting cultural and hunting scenes that are considered to be more than 3,000 years old.
These ancient works are well protected from our planet's natural elements. But unfortunately, the site is under threat from vandalism. The site could do without the graffiti of visitors who should respect the ancient drawings and leave them for others to enjoy. This is Yanshun, once the most powerful fortress between the Pamir and Hindu Kush. Its oldest tranchards are said to originate from the time when Alexander the Great advanced to the Oxus River. From here, the route to Karakul leads north into the Pamir Mountains. In the craggy rocks, the streams pour so rapidly that they're colored by the white spray. That's why they are aptly named the milk flows by the Tajiks. Isabel and Uwe Elger are on their way from Germany to Singapore. We come from Munich. We love the mountains. We've done a lot of mountain biking in the Alps, so we were attracted to these mountains for a new challenge. And this is the most beautiful thing, the highlight of our trip so far. It's sometimes exhausting to ride with such a heavy load up here. On some sections, we had to push our bikes. Luckily for us, we have plenty of time. That's the best thing. If you can spread your journey over a long period, you're completely relaxed about time. If it gets too steep, then we get off our bikes and push a bit and just enjoy the scenery. This mountain has an ambiguous connection to Germany in that it is named after the German philosopher and referred to as Mount Karl Marx. It is 6,726 meters high. The only significant settlement on the Pamir Highway is Murghab, which has approximately 4,000 inhabitants. Murghab was founded in the late 19th century as a Russian military post. Today, it is the main administration center of Eastern Pamir. <laughs> the people here make a living from herding cattle and trading with passing travelers. Somehow, time seems to have stood still in this rugged mountain region. Not much has changed since the end of the Soviet Union era. <laughs> 
One thing that does indicate that we're in modern times is the presence of satellite dishes and mobile phones. Most of the inhabitants of Murghab are Kirkis. In these mountainous regions, their faith has long been dominated by shamanism. Only in recent years have people started turning to Islam. At last, we reach the final stage of the long journey to Karakul, as the road crosses the Ak Baital, the highest pass in Tajikistan, standing at 4,655 meters above sea level. And there is the lake, surreal like a giant dark ink stain between the snowy peaked mountaintops on the roof of the world. It is only now that you can begin to understand why it's called Karakul, the Black Lake. 4,000 meters above sea level, in the middle of a mountain desert, the thin air is difficult for strangers to breathe. But for the people who live here, they claim that with time, you get used to the thin air. However, they say that they take for granted the landscape's beauty and often forget to marvel at the environment they live in when it is there to see every day. Samira has lived like this all her life. Her ancestors and those of her husband, Mama Chakir, lived as Kirkir's herdsmen in these mountains for generations. They hadn't realized how attractive their home was to foreigners until passing travelers arrived to appreciate the stunning scenery. A tourist industry has slowly begun to emerge as more and more people have heard from other travelers that the landscape and scenery is well worth a visit. A Kirkis hotel has opened for tourists who want to see the lake and its surroundings. Actually, not quite a hotel, but more of a yurt. The exact translation for the typical yurt is Kirkis house. However, these tents are actually much more comfortable than they may at first appear. Cool in summer and warm in winter. Visitors sleep, eat, and sit on the floor. The thick rugs prevent the visitors from realizing that the ground beneath them is freezing cold. Our ancestors were born here and lived here. I inherited this Kyrgyz house from my father. We want to turn it into a visitor's site. Therefore, we have set up the tent to welcome tourists. All these houses have been preserved for us by our ancestors and hand-built. And of course, there is our food to offer, yogurt, pastries and fried bread baked in a wok.
There are many legends about the lake, many of them. They say, for example, that it has not always been there. Only a well was there. Eventually, the well's water overflowed and it became this great lake. There are neither advantages or disadvantages to having this lake here. Nature has decided that. So it lies here with its salty water. It's no use to us. Clean drinking water in the Kishla Karakul can only be found in public fountains. Some have been drilled by foreign aid agencies because the area around the Karakul is something of a forgotten corner of Tajikistan. In Soviet times, there was a regular electricity supply and telephone connections to the rest of the country. Today, there is neither electricity nor telephone. Television can only be viewed with Chinese-made solar panels. The redundant masts are used as building material. That's if they don't end up in the stove as firewood. Environmental expert Janshed has other worries. He moderated at the round table of climate researchers in Dushanbe. Here in the Pamir Mountains, he conducts his research based upon the water levels of the lake. He has an appointment with the geologist Naza Khundua Fakri. On the journey to the Karakul, it became clear that the lake still has a lot of secrets to share. The lake is very interesting for many researchers. Some believe that the lake was formed by tectonic processes. Others argue that the lake is a crater where a meteorite struck. The debate goes on even today. Yamshed and Nazakundur are preparing for an expedition which they hope will reveal the secrets of Karakul. They want to know if the water level of the lake is rising or sinking. Other questions they wish to research are, how are glaciers and sea connected? How does the permafrost react? How and where can certain measurements be accurately made? A great many lives in Tajikistan are reliant on the answers to these questions. Karakul is considered to be a key indicator as to whether the water resources of the whole country are under threat by melting glaciers. The rubber dinghy is not necessarily an appropriate research instrument. Nobody has crossed the lake on water for more than 20 years, and it is important to know what kind of boat can ride on the water and where it can cast off. The life vests are a necessity for everyone's safety. 
The weather here can change in seconds. Strong wind and waves can appear from seemingly nowhere and would capsize a boat, such as this, with ease. To date, there has not been any scientific research into how the lake is responding to climate change in Tajikistan. One thing is certain, the glaciers used to be much larger than they are today. Some time at the end of the Pleistocene era, the eastern Pamir was completely covered with ice. So a very long time ago, the whole Pamir was covered with glaciers. The glaciers were probably up to a kilometre in width. When the ice began to melt, the glaciers moved and acted like bulldozers. It is possible that the ice masses dug the basin for the lake and thus created it. The geologist's warning about the weather's temperament is not unfounded. Perhaps many of the legends surrounding the lake are related to the rapid weather changes in the mountains. They say the lake accommodates a tolpa, a stallion with wings, but not everyone can see it. The Almighty shows him to only one person at a time. My cousin saw him once, just like a bird, he flew from one end of the lake to the other. As controversial as the origin of the lake is amongst the experts, so too is the value of the lake to the people who live here. For 35 years, this has been a working place for Bagdadur. Nobody can weave like her. This is a ribbon to hold together a yurt. She can't make her living from the lake. The lake is no use to us. It's salty water. There's not even fish. Yeah. Our lake is very useful. If you're sick, just drink the water and it will heal you. 
the lake, with its salt, has healing powers. Beyond the legendary healing powers, there is a big demand for water from the Karakul. Twice a day, an old truck drives to the lake. For hours, the young men of the village scoop the salty water into a tank. They bring water to the cisterns, which can be found everywhere in the village. They need the water for new buildings being built of clay in the village of Karakol. The bricks are usually made of clay and straw in low-lying areas of the town. Once molded, they are then air-dried. As there is no straw in the barren mountains, the salt from the lake replaces the straw. The bricks need to dry for two months before they are strong enough to build with. During the drying process, the salt crystallizes in the clay and makes the bricks rock hard. The constructed walls consist only of salt and clay. This method of building only exists here at Karakol. Another produce that is unique to the Karakul is the production of felt. The tapping of the yak hair is the first step for producing the felt. The fibers entangle before hot water can shrink the wool into solid mats. Here too, the salt from the lake is in play. It will protect the felt later from vermin.
где-то население здесь где-то около 60 хозяйств здесь. About 60 people live here. They live by farming. But look at how little grows here. Up in the mountains, there are slightly better pastures. So they drive their cattle up to the mountains every summer. This is often very far. Only in September they return. But they have no other choice. Apart from herding cattle, there is nothing here. In fact, most villagers have left their houses on the lake. In summer, the Kirkis herdsmen are still nomads. Mamadzia and his family are nomadic people. Our hospitality is very important to us. My cattle are up here on a mountain meadow, the summer pasture. The place is called Chinasu. There we have yaks, sheep, goats and donkeys. As I said, visitors are welcome any time. Whoever sets off for a mountain 4,000 meters above sea level is aiming high. Mama Majda's animals graze at almost 5,000 meters high. Here, even in the summer, the snow fields don't melt. By jeep, the journey here only takes three hours. Mamadja's family took five days to reach here with the animals and the packed donkey. Kirkis horsemen often need to abandon their horses up here. There are few mammals that can survive in the thin air. There is also just one kind of cattle that flourishes here, the yak. Up here, there is no sign of climate change yet. Even in summer, the temperature never rises above 15 degrees Celsius. The yaks don't mind the cold and altitude. They are well adapted to this specific climate. However, predators still roam, so the yaks are not safe all the time. Every night, we have to bring the animals in. In the morning, they go back to the pasture. We do this because at night, the wolves come. Three or four can kill a calf. The young ones are naive and curious. And the wolves then leap out at their throats and kill them. Mamajsa has goats and sheep, like most of the people here.
Yaks are his pride and joy, and it is a challenge to keep them. They are semi-wild. Therefore, they need these cold places in the mountains. They produce less milk than cows. But because there is not much grass, we have to keep yaks. They give a small amount of milk, but it contains up to 30% fat. Milk processing is a woman's task in Mamajsa's big family, and Samira, the oldest daughter, is in charge. My daughter is making karut. It is a cheese from yak milk. It will be made into little balls and dried in the sun. We will eat the cheese in winter. The yaks offer a lifeline to the people here, providing milk, cheese, meat, and wool. But that's not all the yaks give to the people. In the treeless mountain desert of the Pamir, yak dung is collected and used as fuel. The glaciers on the peaks of the Pamirs are vital for the whole of Central Asia. Mighty rivers such as the Amur Darya and Sir Darya fuel huge power plants and transform deserts into fertile landscapes further downstream. Just a small sample of the glacier water flows directly into Karakul. And this is what makes the water so interesting to climate scientists. No one knows exactly how the ice behaves at the peaks. The salt around the shores of Karakul indicates a dropping water level. This is a good clue for Yamshed. But he's concerned that a particular plant known as the ceratoides is under threat. There is no fuel in Pamir. This makes life difficult for the people who live here. In recent years, they have started chopping down the ceratoides. These are shrubs that have been growing for 20 to 25 years that are essential feed for the yaks. In this barren mountain landscape, every flower is special. And Yamshed is thrilled about this one. 
It thrives in the saline soil that the lake has left behind, perhaps another indication that the caracal is receding. The caracal has to be measured accurately in the upcoming investigation to determine whether its area has decreased or increased. But what we see here is an indication that the lake has shrunk. One can only hope that the glaciers may increase in spite of everything. For now, we have no firm answers about the level of this great lake. Its depth may depend on rainfall, as well as the size of glaciers. An increase in the level of the lake would be great news for the water wealth of Tajikistan, the Pamir, and most importantly, for the Karakul, the Black Lake on the roof of the world. <laughs>